Welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show, where we take a deep dive into the wonderful worlds of psychology and mental wellbeing. Each episode, we dive into the evidence with a global subject expert and break down the science into applicable strategies so you can take steps to improving your mental wellbeing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing Show. Today, we are joined by Dr. Mark Fabian, an assistant professor of public policy at the University of Warwick. In today's conversation, we discuss a number of different topics, and it's a really diverse conversation, which is kind of reflective of Mark's own background, given he's taught and researched in psychology, philosophy, and economics. In today's conversation, we really focus on an article that Mark wrote about four years ago called The Coalescence of Being, which when I first read it, it had a really profound impact on my own kind of professional and personal development, and really kind of introduced me to some some really cool ideas which I still use to this day on an everyday daily basis. Some of those ideas that we discuss uh, include the value of the lost art of introspection, the importance of having an ideal self that you're working towards, and the importance of iterating on your actual self and the ideal self and the discrepancies between that and how you can then make changes to live a more fulfilling life. This is a really diverse conversation. Like I said, I got a lot of value out of it. And if you'd like to read uh, more on the topics on these conversations, I've linked the Coalescence of Being article that Mark wrote below. I hope you enjoy today's episode. If you do, please do hit subscribe and follow. But otherwise, let's jump into today's discussion with Dr. Mark Fabian on the coalescence of being. All right, Dr. Mark Fabian, welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show. Thanks for having me. Really great to chat. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. This is a conversation I have been looking forward to for a number of years now, uh, since I first came across the coalescence of being article you wrote in 2019. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I'm sure it feels like a lot longer for you, but um, it's it had a big impact on me, I think, in terms of putting uh, words to ideas that I've just been mulling over in my head for a long time and just the idea of the actual um, versus the ideal self in particular um, really helped, really resonated with me at the time and it's something that I've kind of used in my own life um, ever since. So thank you for that and I'm excited to dive into that. Um, with you today, but I think for many people, Mark, um, they will never have heard of the the term coalescence of being. So, if you're able to, can you give us like a Google Earth kind of snapshot of what the coalescence of being is? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's a model of the self actualization process, which is a a theme in bodies of psychological and philosophical literature that I'm very influenced by. So uh, I suppose in the psychology stream most famously associated with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the lower needs are kind of basic biological things. And then the highest need is for transcendence or some kind of, I think transcendence actually sits even higher than self-actualization in his um, hierarchy, but uh, that's kind of where it's most famously associated with, but I think it's also in Jung's work. So Jung talks a lot about individuation and then it's certainly a big theme of psychoanalysis and kind of the, the first half of the 20th century in Europe, so Eric Fromm and these kind of people. And parallel to that, it's quite a big theme in the philosophical literature and existentialism. So Sartre, de Beauvoir, Nietzsche, Heidegger to a lesser extent, Jaspers to a lesser extent, big in Kierkegaard, but in a very different way because he's very Christian. Um, So it's a model of the self-actualization process. Self-actualization is um, how an individual grows into themselves. I think it's often uh, associated in popular culture with kind of self-perfection or something of that sort. Uh, And I think that's quite unfortunate because it's not really about being the best you can be. Um, And I find it really toxic when uh, it's sometimes couched in those kind of very, I would say like American capitalist terms around success and these kind of self-optimization. So I kind of joke a lot that Americans in particular tend to conflate self-optimization and self-actualization. So for example, in, in the Huberman Labs podcast, which is like quite good, but that, I think that is often 
flirting with that distinction in an un unpleasant way for me. So it's just about um, getting a sense for who you are authentically, which is partially a matter of self-discovery. So trying to reflect on your intrinsic motivations, your innate dispositions, talents that you have, limitations that you have, that sort of thing. Uh, and also self-creation. So thinking about what sort of person you would like to be, that you would be proud of being, um, that you would be happy to be, that you would be comfortable and content being, that sort of thing. And then going through a process to kind of harmonize um, who you are now in reality with this ideal of yourself um, as fully, fully uh, present. And by present, I don't mean like living in the now. I mean that uh, that potentiality inside you is now represented. Um, and sometimes that will be a matter of achieving various uh, aspirations that you have. So I, I'm an academic and I always wanted to be like a professor or whatever. So now that I'm much further along in that process, I feel much more at peace with myself. But in other cases, it's going to be much more mundane. So it's going to be just about, uh, you know, maybe what you really want to achieve is to be a have a nice little garden and be uh, well integrated into your community and a very reliable person for your social network, something like that. Um, and that's, that's great. If, the, if that's the thing that's authentically you, then bringing that about so that that's the way you live, that's self-actualization. Okay. I'm super interested about what you said as well earlier on. So it's different to self-optimization um, and different to being the best version of yourself is what you, what you said from what I understand. How is that distinction? Cause if I'm, I'm honest, I've certainly fallen into the trap um, of, yeah, of that being the ideal to strive towards is the best version of yourself. Yeah, good question. And I'm probably the same. So um, uh, definitely when I was younger, I was very big into kind of athletic optimization, intellectual optimization, moral optimization, uh, all this kind of stuff, really trying to find all the like little 1% gains I could in my life, that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's fine. Like if that's authentically you, then self-actualization is a process of that. Um, but for a lot of people, that's uh, really not what they are about authentically. Um, so for example, we're doing some research at the moment where we interview people about what determines their life satisfaction. And we find that a lot of people, their life satisfaction is really relational uh, and it's about how they're going with their family, with their friends, with their work colleagues, that sort of thing. And those people tend to have much more of a sort of emphasis on balance in their life. Um, so they, they tend to have more time off. They tend to not cram a lot into their day. And that's what really makes them feel well and feel at peace in their lives. Uh, whereas I am constantly trying to fit more things into my life and finding little ways to optimize. I think there's a big difference between um, those two ways of living, they both can be self-actualization. I am optimizing, but I'm not necessarily optimizing. Um, if someone else was to live the way I live, for whom that's not an authentic way of living, then that would not be good for their self-actualization, even if in some sense they might be optimizing in that they're achieving more career success, they have more friends or whatever, I don't know. Um, and I think that's kind of the key distinction. In terms of the difference with the best version of yourself, um, I guess the, the part that I'm coming back to here is uh, there's this uh, strand of thought coming out of Aristotle where um, well-being is, is uh, defined as, as perfection. Uh, and in the Aristotelian tradition, it's about perfecting human nature. And then he would emphasize uh, our moral and rational faculties and that we really need to become as rational and as moral as we can be. Uh, in the psychological tradition, there's a lot more skepticism around the idea that humans are rational and moral, which I'm quite sympathetic to. <laughs> so the emphasis there is much more on um, human nature as being defined by a certain basic psychological needs for autonomy, competence and relatedness from self-determination theory in particular. Um, and then perfection there is, again, a much more of a, not an optimization idea, but um, kind of respecting those three needs and trying to live in a way that nourishes them. And that's going to be different for different people, uh, but everyone's going to need autonomy. Everyone's going to need some kind of relationships and everyone's going to need to feel competent at the things they value. 
Now, for some people, that competence is going to be like Olympic standard deadlifting or something. Um, for other people, it's going to be like feeling generally healthy, something like that. Okay, okay. So ultimately, everyone is at their own uh, will and beck and call to decide what their ideal self is and what a self-actualized self is by the sounds of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's totally the case. It's all about authenticity um, and it's it's all about, yeah, being true to yourself as it were yeah okay fantastic yeah so oh yeah i'd love to dive into the kind of those those pillars of um coalescence of being that you identified uh four of them uh, in particular that i kind of pulled out and i think you explicitly highlighted the first being comfort in ambiguity so could you kind of walk us through yeah what what that is what comfort in ambiguity means yeah this is a big topic um I, maybe an important little bit of preamble here is that I mostly came into these ideas from nihilism. That was the main challenge to my well-being when I was younger is that I felt like I wanted to be a good person and I didn't know what that meant. Um, it seems to me like... So when I think it's natural as a human, but particularly as a young human, to think uh, where can I find the moral truth and then try to just do that. So historically we have either represented our moral truths in religious doctrines or at least in some kind of very thick cultural practices that are kind of passed down to us so even shorn of all its of its religious garbs you can still see protestantism and kind of american capitalism as examples of these thick cultures like what matters in your life is that you're making a lot of money you're working hard you've got material success these kind of things um now very at a very young age, like 17, I sort of felt like all of these structures that were passing on moral norms were kind of empty. Like I got very deep into the metaphysics and I was sort of like, it doesn't seem to me like the notion of a moral fact is very coherent. I won't bore your readers with the kind of philosophical side of that. Um, but I, I see this trend over and over again, particularly in young men, I suppose, but I think it's also common in, in women that you're looking for some kind of objective moral framework and then you'll do that. Um, and I basically think that the metaphysical truth is that that objective moral framework does not exist. You can't derive it rationally. It does. It's not written into the firmament in any way. The universe is normatively ambiguous, which means that uh, it's not devoid of meaning and value. So this is idea in Camus' work of absurdism, that the universe just is meaningless, can't have value in it. That's fully nihilistic. And I don't think it's true. So we do naturally find certain things meaningful. We find we have intrinsic motivations for all sorts of behaviors. We care about stuff. Like if you sit down and quietly reflect on yourself as a child, I'm sure you'll remember things that you just enjoy doing. Um, and I'm sure that if you spend a week not ruminating and being too depresso and just letting your values come to you, you will notice that there are some things that you just get a bit fired up about. Certain political events just kind of piss you off uh, or whatever it might be. Those are your things that you just care about naturally. Um, but they're not properties of the universe, they're properties of you. So value is something that's subjective and ambiguity means that we are bringing value to the universe, not discovering it out there in the universe. Um, now, the challenge then with ambiguity is that it's never really solid. You're always kind of sitting in this, this space where you need to have the strength of your own convictions. And it can be particularly challenging to exist just with the strength of your own convictions if you don't have people around you reinforcing those values all the time. So this is a big reason why Historically, we had these thick cultures where everyone is simultaneously intersubjectively reinforcing certain norms. Nowadays, in this kind of meta-modern situation that we're in now, we have smaller communities forming. Like if you go on Reddit and you look up any sort of value principle, like the zero waste community or veganism or effective altruism, these kind of things, these are normative communities that are forming to help people reinforce their values and feel them palpably. So it's not just me who feels this way, other people feel this way and we're going to help each other to live this way. But you always need to be comfortable with the idea that these values are just things that you care about. They're not facts. 
they're not uh, things that can be proven decisively. Uh, and that's what I mean by comfort with ambiguity, that the world is open. That brings you a lot of moral freedom. You can care about whatever it is that you want to care about, but ultimately it's about whether you care that that's the last thing that's, that's the bedrock, the foundation of, it, of everything. So that being said, then, is it fair to say that there aren't, or well, would you say that there are better values than others, like categorically universally, or is it all up to the individual to kind of decide um, what that is? And that's the level of that ambiguity goes to. Um, so I broadly go with the latter. Um, so I'm pretty, pretty extreme in my moral views. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down into metaethics as it's called. Um, I think a lot of people's concerns around moral relativism, which is this idea that like, oh, well, this other person's doing something I find abhorrent, but it's not objectively abhorrent, so I can't judge it. Um, I think that's broadly not true. So there's, there's two things that we need to keep in mind. So one is that certain values are just not really compatible with human psychology. Um, so it's very rare that you're going to find someone who's like, I don't know, an authentic baby torturer, but you know, authentic torturers is one example. So there are some people who are super sadistic. They don't particularly care about consent towards that sadism. So there's examples of guards in, in, um, SS concentration camps and stuff who seem to display these kind of qualities. Um, but for the most part, uh, these kind of behaviors aren't compatible with a well-functioning society. And so we've found legal systems against them. So not moral systems. We don't say the reason why we're doing this is because we think you're evil. Um, the, re the reason why we do that is by saying that we don't think this is conducive to effective social organization. And so we're going to outlaw these things. But then you make you recognize that when you put someone in jail, you're not putting them in jail because they're evil and you, you're forced to like, the nature of righteousness compels you to put this person in jail. You are acting out of your preferences. You don't think that person's behavior is acceptable. You need to take responsibility for the action that you're, you're doing there. Um, the third thing that's worth um, keeping in mind is that building on these first two issues, you can still judge someone. I mean, if someone does something that I really don't agree with, um, I'm trying to think of some examples, but so one, one famous case, I guess, was around the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. There were people like Christopher Hitchens, very famous atheist, arguing that on the basis of liberal values, the West should get much more involved in Islamic countries trying to um, intervene on behalf of the rights of women. And this was very controversial. Um, I guess uh, I'm not sure how much I uh, agree with the interventionist argument, but I certainly have quite strong views as well about the rights of women. So if I see someone living in a way that I don't think is compatible with that, I think you can go up to them in uh, a civil, courteous way when the opportunity presents itself <laughs> and say, hey, like, I don't reckon this is a good way to do things. Um, here are my arguments. Now, it's not the case that your arguments are going to ever like cut through to the, the objective moral truth, but they might still be compelling. Like people say things to me all the time that I don't think are the objective moral truth, but that I find compelling around vegetarianism, for example, um, or around factory farming. And your brain will just receive those arguments and it might find them compelling and you will find that your behavior changes as a result of being compelled by those arguments. It might not be instantaneous because we're very uh, uh, plural in our psychology. Like we have multiple selves. You're going to need to reconcile those things. Maybe only a part of you found it compelling. Maybe there are other values you have that's not compatible with. You've got to work through that. Um, but I think you can still engage in moral discourse, moral contestation, all these kind of things within this kind of moral relativist system. And indeed, I think this is much more compatible with liberal politics and contemporary society than objectivist moral theory, which is ultimately about saying, well, like these arguments are correct the way mathematical proofs are correct. And, and you're just going to, you're going to see the truth so powerfully that it's, you're just going to, it's going to force you to change your behavior just by sheer weight of logic. Uh, I don't think this ever exists. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I take that um, as there are no real moral facts um, and that's kind of the, the ambiguity, if you like, is kind of leaning into what is intrinsic to you, well, what does discomfort in ambiguity look like then? Just to help me kind of understand the, 
concept because I think before this conversation, I conflated comfort in ambiguity as tolerance of uncertainty, but it's not quite the same. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's about uncertainty. There's definitely a degree of uncertainty in there around like fallibilism. So fallibilism is this idea that you could be wrong. Um, I think fallibilism is really important to the philosophy of science that comes particularly out of Karl Popper's work. You also see it in um, Nazim Taleb's uh, kind of epistemology for life stuff. Like, so I don't know if you're familiar with Taleb's work. He wrote like the black swan, the anti-fragile, these quite um, a lot of books that are very beloved by finance bros. Um, but ultimately they're, they're kind of self-help books about how to understand uncertainty in your life and have a good attitude to knowledge and learning and these kind of things. And I think they are quite fundamental to well-being and to coalescence. So you definitely want to be comfortable with the idea that you might be wrong, that you might have not all the facts that you need to go out there and gather more information that people that disagree with you, um, nonetheless might have very good reasons for disagreeing with you and you should investigate those reasons. And I think if, if your listeners are interested in this stuff, then there's this book by Julia Garleth called The Scout Mindset um, that I think goes into a lot of these ideas in a very accessible way. Hey everyone, just a quick break from today's episode to ask for a small favor. If any of the episodes of The Mentor Wellbeing Show have brought value to your life, I would be super grateful if you were to hit subscribe or follow as this is how I continue to grow The Mentor Wellbeing Show and communicate mental well-being science and mental well-being strategies out to the broader community. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit subscribe or follow. And now back to today's discussion with Dr. Mark Fabian. Uh, so I have a, a dear friend, we don't really speak to each other anymore, unfortunately, um, who is very uncomfortable with ambiguity. Um, and it's probably the smartest person I know. And basically every... This friend of mine has burned through every moral system in the space of like a year. So when they were sort of 17, 18, they were very woke. They had kind of progressive moral ideology, burned through that in about a year, kind of realized it was incompatible with some other moral principles from liberalism and, and respect for persons and stuff like that, that they weren't comfortable contravening. Then they became very kind of utilitarian um started to think that that was kind of a comprehensive morality and, and always burning through these ideas taking them to their logical extreme very quickly because if they are in fact moral facts they need to be logically coherent the way that factual systems are very coherent um so it became very utilitarian drifted into kind of effective altruism um which is a very utilitarian uh group for the most part burned through that as well because utilitarianism is not uh, ultimately entirely coherent um in part because we have three moral intuitions so we have utilitarian intuitions we have kantian or deontological intuitions and we have virtue ethics intuitions totally makes sense that we would have evolved all three of those um so utilitarianism on its own is not really a sufficient um sufficient moral framework so you can poke holes in it fairly easily and this person as i said is extremely bright so they'll find those holes very fast um then had a bit of a nervous breakdown coming out of that nervous breakdown found the church um became very much a born again christian and is now like really a very very strict catholic um to the point where they are concerned that the pope is a bit of a heretic uh like this kind of stuff so i think uh, this friend of mine is an example of someone who's very uncomfortable with ambiguity. So they can't tolerate the idea that values emerge from them. They need a system to conform to. Uh, and I think you do come across these people all the time. I mean, I think actually most humans are like this. Um, it's quite a difficult thing to become comfortable with ambiguity. Uh, I find among academics, there's a lot of reluctance to accept moral relativism. They often say, well, then we just end up with Nazis or something. I'm like quite the opposite. Um, the Nazis, Stalin, all the kind of bad people in history, all were very certain of their uh, access to the moral facts. Um, I think you find this a lot in the kind of revived theocratic movements. Um, people like Ben, Sh so ben Shapiro and some less savory characters are kind of figureheads for this sort of 
new theocratic um, politics, particularly in the US. Um, I definitely think you see this in a lot of fascist movements, um, which are kind of uh, resurgent in Europe at the moment. I think you see it very much on the fringes of left-wing politics as well, um, where people just really need to get into some dogma. Um, yeah, and it, and really the dogma is appealing to them. They don't like that it's messy and chaotic and uncertain. They want something that's very clear um, because they have what the existentialists called bad faith. So they don't want to take responsibility for their own decisions. They want a system that tells you what to do. Um, they want to behave in accordance with that system, then they want to punish people who deviate from it. Uh, and in evolutionary terms, this is exactly the kind of psychology that we've evolved. We want to be able to fit into groups that have certain value systems. So it makes sense that people behave like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This makes sense. So this is kind of like deferring your own value system to an external framework because it, it's difficult to deal with the gray area and it's easier to have that black and white truth and not truth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the real key, like, um, I suppose key takeaways I had from your article in terms of a process of moving more towards the coalescence between the actual and ideal self was the, the concept of introspection and the real importance of that. So can you kind of, uh, elucidate, you know, the, the value of introspection in um, the self-actualization and coalescence process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's probably my favorite. I think this is like the most important thing we don't talk about enough. So the first thing I'll say is that I think most of our culture, particularly the self-help culture, um, is about getting people to look outside themselves in some way. Um, so it's like read this book, listen to this podcast, um, go to this church, whatever it might be. They'll have the answers for you there. Um, so the first thing about introspection is just that most probably the answers are in you, certainly to start with, um, the broad brush strokes of where you want to go, only you have those answers and you've got to turn inwards to find them. Once you have some direction, then you want to interact with the world that might, uh, give you details, help you refine those broad brush strokes into a, a more co complex and coherent picture. Um, but the first point I want to make about introspection is just that if you are ever uncertain of what to do with your life, uncertain of where your well-being is, uncertain of anything like that, just turn inwards. Um, and I think that that's really fundamental to all psychoanalytic traditions is that you have to look inside first, particularly Carl Rogers. So Carl Rogers is probably my favorite psychoanalyst, and that was one of his main arguments. Um, so that's the first point about introspection. The next thing is that, the, the process of self-actualization, to give you a, a quick explanation of it, um, as I sort of outline it in the book. So we start with self-discrepancy theory from Tori Higgins, which is this idea that you have this kind of actual self, which is who you are now, the ideal self, which is who you'd like to be, and then the ought self, which is who you feel a responsibility to be. Um, and you want to harmonize across those three concepts. So you begin with introspection to try to discover to some extent what you've got to be honest with yourself about who you actually are. Um, so if you're a pathological narcissist, you, you can't be honest with yourself about who you are. Um, that's why it's a pathology. Uh, then you also want to have a good sense of authentically who you want to be. So by the time we reach adulthood, we have internalized so many things from our society and our parents and our peers about what is desirable to be that we need to kind of take some time to sort of meditate on our inner desires rather than other people's. So try to find what's authentically you um, and also authentically what your values are. So you might uh, have some conflicts here, like, you know, a lot of young men want to spread their seed or whatever, um, but then they also don't want to leave train wrecks and break hearts or something like that. So that's maybe not the most uh, PC example, but I think it is quite a common example of, of a conflict between an ideal and a not self. Um, so once you've, once you've introspected a bit on what these things are, you've got to go out into the world and try to bring your actual self into alignment with your ideal self and your ought self. And that's going to involve making choices and behaving in a way that's uh, coherent with who you want to be. So uh, I think the example I use in the paper um, is say you want to be an astronaut. Right? Again, it doesn't need to be this ambitious. It's just easier to explain things with ambitious goals. 
So you want to be an astronaut. There are certain uh, sub values, sub behaviors that are within that high level goal. So you've got to be good at physics. You've got to be quite fit to be an astronaut. So maybe you enroll in physics classes and you enroll in the gymnastics group. So you're bringing your behaviors into line with who you'd like to be. And now in, in doing those behaviors, you're going to get feedback. So I use this idea of the disclosure of being from de Beauvoir. So you, you behave in a certain way and then you kind of revealed in reality, you get this information. So you might think, oh, I'm going to be an astronaut. And then you go to the gym and you can't do a pull up and you're like, okay, well, I'm very far from being an astronaut here. Um, and now you want to introspect on the signals that you get from these behaviors that you're doing. So there are going to be two major kinds of signals. There's going to be your affective signals. So these are emotional, motivational signals, things like that, feelings that you get. Um, and I think a lot of the time um, we tend to push away our feelings, or I certainly did, um, and focus on reasons. And I think this is definitely the case um, with people who are uncomfortable with ambiguity, is that they want clear reasons, facts. Actually, I think we should give primacy to our feelings and our intuitions. So say um, you're failing to do this pull-up, just to take a really small example. Like, does that, when, when you reflect on that sensation that you have, do you feel like inspired to work harder to do pull-ups? Um, in which case, maybe this is totally a fine path to go down. You should explore it further, see where you get to. But it might be the case that actually in doing this push-up and in failing to do this push-up, you just kind of suddenly think, this is stupid. Like, kind of, why am I doing this? You sort of don't really have any motivation for it. Um, and it's not like depressing that you can't do it. It's just empty. It's kind of amotivated. And you're like, well, actually, maybe then this isn't for me. So you've got to reflect on the kind of information that you get from the world. Sometimes that's going to be feelings. Other times that's going to be social feedback. Um, so I think for disclosure, it's really important to sometimes check with other people, whether they perceive you the way you perceive yourself. Um, so another trivial example, I used to think that I was quite a punctual person. Um, and I once went to get some Chinese food with a mate of mine back at university and I was a few minutes late and I said to him, oh, Hey man, sorry, I'm, uh, I know I'm a few minutes late. He said, that's all right. You're always five minutes late. I'm used to it. And I was like, what do you mean I'm five? I'm always, I'm not five, I'm punctual. Um, so that's kind of an example of, and then I had to, you know, be honest with myself and reflect on whether I was in fact always five minutes late. Um, and then I've got to make a change because now if I feel like genuinely I do want to be a punctual person and I have this pattern of behavior that I'm not punctual, well, now I need to either accept that I'm not a punctual person or I need to change my behavior. Um, so social feedback is also quite important. And then introspecting on this feedback is mostly just a matter of consciously processing it. So not just having intuitions, but trying to surface those intuitions so that you can reflect on them and derive reasons. And then often your reasons will be generalizable. Um, so you might find, for example, this is another, I'm using trivial examples because they're easy, but you might be really compelled by the argument that you shouldn't eat veal because it's a child, something like that. Like it's okay to eat a full grown cow that's had a good life or whatever, but you shouldn't eat babies. Um, and then obviously you'd be able to extrapolate that reason to suckling pigs and um, whatever other um, baby animals we, we tend to eat. Um, so if you have an intuition that there's something not right about eating veal, then you, you introspect on it and you surface the reason for that intuition. And then you can extrapolate that. And in that way, often your intuitions can be used to inform many more aspects of your life. Mm, okay. I really like what you said in particular, Mark, there about um, it, the answers kind of being internal and really valuing the, the internal kind of signals there because, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of times that, you know, your article really resonated with me. The ideas really did have an impact on me. And just on reflection, as you say that, I think at the time I was looking a lot to external sources. I remember... I would have been in my early 20s when I first came across your article. Look, I'd spend like hours and hours at night YouTubing different videos, looking for life purpose. How do you find your life purpose? Tiny Buddha articles all, all night long, looking externally for that answer. And I think one of the, the key concepts was, you know, like I said, introspection and, and really kind of 
I suppose guiding me to to value my own thoughts and and that I am the expert in my own life, you know, to to quote Carl Rogers. So, yeah, that really does um, resonate and make a lot of sense. Oh, great! Yeah, well, I'm so yeah. like pleased that it's had an impact. I mean, when I write, I'm not, I'm much more interested in whether this work's going to help people, not whether it's going to like advance the academic discourse. Um, uh, and I'm writing a popular book at the moment that should be out in. 2025 that's kind of built out of these ideas oh okay yeah, yeah. I'll definitely keep an eye for that and, and <laughs> yeah. actually on a tangent um i can't i'll show you after we're, we're done recording but mm. I, I didn't just put this up um knowing i was speaking to you but um you know i, I read a, a fair amount but i have three mm. learnings just three mm -hmm. out of the many things that I've, I've read um three kind of key learnings from books one is um, the fully functioning person, Carl Rogers, mm -hmm. is pinned up yeah. right here. Another one is Rachel Dodge's model of the seesaw model of well-being. I don't know if you heard of that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the others is the other one is yours. I've distilled your article, Colin to be down to eight steps. So you're in a last oh, cool. company okay. with Carl Rogers there. So. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to get your eight steps as well. That might be quite useful for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see how accurate they are at the end of this conversation. Yeah. But. Um, cool, cool. Uh, one thing, though, in terms of introspection that I wonder is when does like introspection become rumination? I think you alluded to it earlier. When does it become kind of, you know, dysfunctional in the sense that you actually might benefit from an external source? Yeah, I don't have a particularly good answer to this question because you asked me this in advance and I have been pondering it. Um, I suppose one of the key features of rumination is that you cycle through the same thoughts without um, any kind of breakthrough and without sort of taking any action on those thoughts. Um, and that seems quite crucial to me, um, to understand whether you're ruminating or whether you're, um, functionally introspecting. So when you introspect, sometimes you, there won't be a conclusion, like you'll just think about some stuff. Um, maybe your thoughts will get a bit more organized, but there won't really be any takeaway. And then maybe you need to return to those thoughts at a later date. The unconscious or the subconscious mind or whatever chews on stuff it like digests it over time sometimes you just got to wait um but i think there are a lot of uh times when people get sort of paralyzed um in particular ways of thinking in particular ways of being uh, and this is fairly common in therapy cases like, so people go to a therapist because they say look i again let's take a simple example like i, I drink a lot and i shouldn't drink but I can't stop myself, like help me out. Um, and I think similarly, you can, you can find all sorts of examples of people being aware that uh, they have certain destructive patterns of behavior or something, and they're reflecting on those patterns of behavior, but they're not making any change. Um, I think the case study that I would maybe want to spend a bit more time talking about is if you have like ruminative nihilism, because this is something that I'm fairly familiar with, um, so ruminative nihilism is, uh, like similar to what you describe now, like you spend a lot of time thinking about well, how can I get purpose into my life? Um, but where you get stuck at all the time is that there is like no such thing as purpose. Like you just get stuck in this sort of absurdist attitude that where well, everything's meaningless anyway, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and I don't, uh, think there is much of a way out of that except to not think about it because rationally it sort of is true um you have to feel your way out of that problem uh so you have to do things that you find enjoyable raw um like uh preferably things that have some some social connection or some kind of uh connection to wider society so I find me personally, I really enjoy video gaming. Um, and if I'm uh, feeling very despondent about life or whatever, I can often just play Street Fighter for like seven hours. Um, that'd be totally fine. But after playing Street Fighter for a week, you don't necessarily, you might, you've entertained, like you got out of bed for a week or whatever, but you don't necessarily feel like you've made breakthroughs in terms of getting out of your, out of your abyss. Um, so I think it'd be better to, um, I don't know, think about, uh, some moral thing that you're doing, 
like I get really pissed off by trash on the street. So maybe I'll just go and collect trash. But even better would be to join a local litter picking group so that you meet other people who share this kind of intrinsic motivation that you have. Um, and then you feel motivation to pick up the trash. And now you will meet other people who also feel that way. And then you will practice that together. And the fact that you reinforce each other's feelings is what's going to get you out of the slump as opposed to try to think your way out of it. So if we come back um, a little bit to the affective signals then, so you mentioned kind of introspecting on that and, you know, what kind of meaning you derive from that, what kind of feeling you derive from that um, is important to tell you where to iterate or whether to iterate in fact. So where do we draw the line then between say like a hedonic feels really good and I use hedonic very loosely, but it just feels good in the moment and versus say something that um, may not feel good in the moment necessarily, but derives some sort of delayed gratification. So like I hate studying for stats, but I need to do it. Um, and ultimately it does help serve a higher order purpose if you like. So yeah, just where do you kind of draw that line with those affective signals? That's something I'll be pondering. Yeah, great question. Great question. Um, all right, I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll focus on one chunk of an idea here that I think is big. So I think it's really useful to consider the motivation spectrum from self-determination theory here. So uh, if anyone's not familiar with it, everyone should become familiar with self-determination theory. I think super important body of work, one of the best kind of very chunky meaty theories to come out of social psychology this century. Um, and there's a, an article from the year 2000, I think called something like the what and why of goal pursuits. That is a very good summary of the basics. And then there's also a book from 2019, maybe that was like Ryan and Desi's retirement volume where they summarized like their life's work and the work of all their proteges and stuff that's just called self-determination theory. And it's like this big or something. It's great. I've got it. The handbook. Is that what you're talking about? Handbook of SDT? No, but that's good too. So the handbooks are also great. Um, <laughs> this one's got like a sailboat on the cover. I don't know why, but anyway, it's all really good. Everyone should read it. Um, all right. So the motivation spectrum in SDT, it runs from extrinsic at one end to intrinsic at the other. Um, the canonical case of extrinsic motivation is uh, duress. So someone is like forcing you to do something either with the whip or a gun or whatever, blackmail. Um, so you don't want to do this thing. So it's entirely extrinsic and, uh, the, you require lots of self-regulation in order to do it. So you really need to like get one part of your brain to force another part of your brain to do it. Um, so this can be very depleting. So you're going to find it exhausting to do this kind of behavior and it's going to suck. Fortunately, in most societies today, we have very little kind of pure duress. Um, but historically, there would have been tons of it. Um, then you have introjected motivation, which is uh, still quite self-regulated. It's where you want something that is contingent to the activity itself. So uh, I guess health is an example. So a lot of people go jogging. They don't really like jogging. They don't really like exercise in general, but they like being healthy. They want to live for a long time. So that's an introjected motivation. Another canonical example is that we want our parents' love and adoration and respect. And so we do chords on the piano, even though we hate it, like that sort of thing. We'd, we'd rather play FIFA. We try to convince our parents that it's all finger coordination. It's the same thing. Your parents don't want to hear it. They just want you to play piano. Um, so you do that. Again, introjected stuff is usually going to be more exhausting over time. It's going to have willpower associated with it. Um, and you want to think about uh, how sustainable this activity is and how rewarding this contingent thing is. So in the case of health, for example, a lot of people are able to sustain three sessions at the gym a week for an hour um, over a lifetime because they value health that much. Um, but in other cases, the, the thing that's contingent to the activity itself is just not that valuable for you. And you can introspect on, on that sort of thing. One step further along, you've got identified values. And I think this is the really the interesting one for me, um, particularly as part of coalescence. So identified activities are where you value the thing itself, 
but you don't find the motivation for it intrinsic. Um, so the example from my life is that, uh, when I went to study economics, I had to do bridging in math and I hate math. Um, I just really don't like doing it to this day. I'm not, not particularly fond of it. Um, and I think it was at the beginning, it was like almost introjected motivation. Um, so I wanted to get into my master's program. And so I had to do this math in order to get into my master's program. Um, but a bit further along the line, it became identified, which is, uh, so the, the way it happened was that I got really into statistics, which I think we don't teach people early enough. Um, and statistics really plugged into a lot of my kind of fondness for theory of knowledge and being certain about things and kind of learning. Um, and so at that point I started to be interested in statistics. I wanted to learn more stats but I still didn't really like doing stats. Like I didn't really like learning about estimators and proving properties and all this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I think it's much easier to sustain your motivation if you have this identified um, type to it. And then the next one along is uh, integrated, which is where an identified value gets connected to something that is intrinsically motivated. Um, so let's talk about intrinsic real quick. That's just something that comes naturally to you. It's something that you do spontaneously for its own sake. You don't really need any help motivating you to do it. So like video games uh, and often intrinsically motivated things are going to be like really hedonic and they won't necessarily have big meaning associated with them. They won't feel like you're doing something super valuable. And like, that's cool. Like if you can sustain your motivation to just like go rock climbing all the time and you don't think that you're making the world a better place or something, but you just really froth rock climbing like that. Don't fight it. Just, just go with it. Um, <laughs> So, but sometimes they will be quite meaningful. Like I guess Nelson Mandela probably had intrinsic motivation to end apartheid. Um, and that probably kept him going through his years as a gorilla and all this kind of stuff. Um, okay. So then integrated is where these in identified becomes connected to intrinsic. So the example that I often use is many people are intrinsically motivated to hang out with their friends. They're only interjected motivated to exercise. Um, if you can, do exercise in like a social soccer club or something like that, then now you're hanging out with your friends while exercising. And so you'll find it easier to motivate your exercise. So coming back to your question about introspecting on um, different kinds of affective feedback, I think a really important form of affective feedback is what kind of motivation you're feeling. And some of the um, feelings that are going to be in that milieu are things like exhaustion. So if you're feeling really tired by an activity, probably it's interjected because you're having to use a lot of willpower to do it. Um, if you really have vitality and you feel kind of energized to go and do stuff, it's much more likely that it's intrinsically motivated. Um, and if you feel kind of inspired and you get a sense of achievement when you progress in something, it's probably an identified behavior because you're moving closer to who you'd like to be or the values that you want to live in accordance with. Um, and so there might be some hedonic stuff in there, there might be some delayed gratification. And then in terms of thinking about whether the delayed gratification is worth it or not, um, I, want you th I think you should think mostly about how sustainable your motivation is for that particular activity. So like in, in the case of my math, if I'd stayed with just calculus for like five years, I couldn't have done it. Um, like there did come a point where I finished my master's and I was starting my PhD um, where I could have done advanced microeconomics, which is like um, using set point theory. Yeah, set point theory. Is that right? Anyway, using a bunch of uh, real analysis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bunch of real analysis to prove um, various properties um, like welfare theorems and stuff. And I broadly to this day think this work is useless. Like it's just not really valuable. It's like where economics goes off into the ivory tower and navel gazing. Um, so if I'd had to be doing that, I would have lost all the motivation for it. Um, but because I transitioned much more towards uh, applied issues in my PhD and there was a bit of math still there, but it was mostly statistics and stuff. I could sustain my motivation for it. And that was fine. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, the real message that's coming out through all of this, including, you know, what you just said is the real value of um, reflecting internally, introspecting, being more psychologically minded to your own values, needs, and even desires, like what intrinsically, you know, sets your world alight. So, um, and I, I suppose on that that point, you know, just finally, I, I wanted to ask, is there 
an art to introspection? You know, do you have ways in which you go about introspecting? Do you have like set, I don't know, set time per week, for example, an hour of, you know, no phone and you're just with your thoughts? Is it a daily meditation practice? Is that something that you've, you've considered? Um, I have considered it and I think I've been quite bad at it lately. So I've actually really like just this week started to much more purposefully um, go about this kind of stuff. Um, when I was younger, I would introspect a lot more, but I grew up kind of before smartphones. Um, so like Facebook came in my last year of undergrad or something like that. I only got a phone at university and that was like, you know, like a Nokia thing that could send like text messages. That was about it. Um, so the world was much less distracting. And I think by the time the world got quite distracting, um, I already had very clear goals around um, either tennis, which I used to play, well, I used to train for tennis just like constantly. Um, so yeah, I had one year off where I play, I was on court like 45 hours a week and then in the gym another 20 or something. And then when I went back to university to do honors, I was still playing like 35 hours a week or something. Um, so I was just really dedicated to that. And then when I, later on, when I was like dedicated to my studies and stuff, then I'd just be doing that. And so I, I was much harder to distract, I guess, cause I had these very strong goals that lasted a very long time, like all through my PhD on stuff. And I remember having times in my life where I was, you know, fallout three came out or something and I was really desperate to play fallout three, but I was like, actually, I just can't afford to like go into the video game cave for 150 hours here and play this game. So I'm just. I'm not going to buy a new computer. So I do these kind of behavioral um, self nudges to, to change my environment so that I wouldn't be tempted by certain things. Um, and then this just kind of kept going. Like when you finish your PhD, you then have this very difficult early career academic market. So you just got to like knuckle down and publish heaps of papers and stuff. And I've sort of just come out of this. Um, my personal life has, uh, been a bit topsy-turvy the last um, year or so. And I also, I'm feeling a bit less motivated by my career than I have been in the past. So I think I need to kind of refound my goals and values and stuff for midlife. I thought I'd have kids by now as well. And I thought that would kind of force me to change my tempo and reflect a lot more on my life, but I haven't, that hasn't worked out. Um, and so, yeah, now I'm thinking about, well, what, what do I want from the next few years? How, what do I care about? How do I want to organize my time? And so the techniques I have for that, so one I've already mentioned, I think you do need to change your environment so that it's got fewer distractions in it. So small things like <laughs> I don't charge my phone next to me in the bedroom. I charge my phone out in the living room so that when I wake up in the morning, it's not there. Um, I also sleep on, I sleep Japanese style on the floor on tatami mats and futons. So I have a kind of morning ritual where I put those away and then I do like a little 10 minute yoga thing. Um, and I generally try and like wake up before I go to any screens. Um, in the, I find it really useful if I'm on a bus or a train or something like that. to like not distract myself. Um, so don't look at your phone, just like make sure you're comfortable being bored. And I think one of the most telltale signs that you're not going to be capable of introspecting is if you get bored easily. And I don't mean like, oh, what am I going to do with my day? I don't have anything to do with my day. That's like, that's big boredom. Um, that's fine. I think if you've got big boredom, then introspect on what you might want to do with yourself. I'm talking about little boredom, like that I need constant dopamine hits. Um, so I need to go on to Twitter or whatever. If you discover that you're like that, I think you need to take drastic action <laughs> and I'm a bit like that. Um, so yeah, I've got friends who have like, uh, no screen time after 8 PM kind of rules, which I think is quite good. Um, so I try and not to, um, I try to like, I, sometimes I have to work quite late, but it's kind of like nine o'clock. I've shut down stuff or try to anyway. And then I'll like have a wind down. Maybe I'll read a bit like a comic book or something, but just like no blue light, have a shower. Yeah. Don't blue light yourself before bed, I think is very helpful. <laughs> um, a lot of people find that their brain really works really fast when they're running. 
Um, so I think if, if you have an exercise that, that helps you to focus in on what's going on in your head and do that, I kind of have the opposite. Like when I'm rock climbing, I have no thoughts. Um, I get really high flow from rock climbing, um, because you have to concentrate so hard on what you're doing. Um, so I find that a really good reset, I tend to work till four, then I'm brain dead, go climbing. And then when I come out of climbing at like six o'clock, I'm sort of refreshed, but I also haven't crammed my brain with other junk um, because I've, I haven't had music in when I'm climbing. I don't talk to people. I don't read. I don't do anything. I just climb and stretch. Um, and then I can often do some good introspection at that time, like while I cook dinner or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think it's mostly about being comfortable with boredom. So being comfortable with having an empty head and just letting stuff flow into there. Um, one thing I do on that is probably twice a year, I go on like a five day hike and don't take anything with me. So don't take a book, don't take a phone, nothing. So you're just like bored. There's nothing to do except like look at stuff. Um, and I find that usually by about the fourth day, I'm like really bored. It's starting to become like quite annoying. I've sort of run out of thoughts, um, cause your brain will just chew on stuff that's in there. And then by the fifth day, now you're kind of like empty headed and then you can get new stuff. So some people find silent meditation retreats really useful for this same reason. Um, I, I find that a little bit too excruciating, um, particularly because there's people around at silent meditation retreats. So I just take myself off hiking. I find that can also be quite useful. That's yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, I think um, the, the board, being comfortable being bored and changing your environment are both very linked for a lot of people definitely for me i think my phone habits are taking over my day-to-day -day. any moment of silence where i'm not doing something it's just phone laptop etc so if i can change my environment much like the way that you were saying phone is not charging in your room as a little you know tactic i think that's going to certainly impact my ability to be comfortable with boredom yeah Brilliant. Um, oh, we've covered a lot, Mark. This has been really, really cool to dive into, like I said, a, a topic that's had great meaning for me. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with, with listeners, particularly, you know, students listening? Yeah. Yeah. One thing, one thing. So uh, I think the most important virtue in people is integrity. Um, and I talk about that a fair bit in the paper and a lot in this book that's coming out. So, uh, and I think it's crucial to self-actualization and this whole introspection stuff. So, uh, you can only be the person you want to be if you like stick to it. Um, and if you really find that you can't stick to it, then that person that you ideally like would like to be is not suited to you. You got to, sometimes that's a very bitter pill to swallow, but often it's kind of a relief. Um, you're like, oh, well, I wanted to be like super duper fit or something, but actually that's, I just can't take myself to the gym that much. Um, one thing for me is I just like really don't like lifting weights. So as much as I, would like to be heaps buff or something. That's not a thing to do. Um, but I think this is particularly important with moral stuff. Uh, I think humans have an amazing, very depressing to me <laughs> capacity to like say one thing and do another. Um, and I guess this comes out in the moral psychology literature that um, often our moral rationalizations are to convince other people that we're moral. Um, meanwhile, we're doing kind of our own thing and that our moral judgments come long before our, moral reasoning. Uh, and so people are very capable of kind of outwardly thinking, believing themselves to be, I don't know, vegetarian. And then you look at your diet and you're like, oh, holy shit, I actually eat meat like three times a week. Um, so in order to become yourself, you're going to need to have integrity and you need to act with integrity. Um, and I think this is something that you really need to cultivate and you need to have quite a lot of self-compassion when you get started with it, that your integrity is often going to suck initially. And you can't bring your whole life into alignment at once. You've got to like look for the places where you can make a small change and then ratchet that and just keep making small changes. And over the course of a couple of months or a couple of years, you'll suddenly transform quite significantly and you'll be living much more in accordance with who you wanted yourself to be. Um, but if there's one virtue you want to cultivate in yourself, it's your integrity that you have the right to make promises. If you, if you say something, then you do it. Oh, fantastic, Mark. Yeah, that's a great, great um, yeah, point to finish on, I think. So, yeah, I really appreciate your time and, um, again, all your work so far. And the name of that book, um, is, that, is there anywhere I can link 
um for listeners to to go to or uh, no it's it's we're actually auctioning it like this week with publishers um so i don't know who's publishing it yet and they have a lot of control over the title so the current title is um for my, in my head <laughs> uh is wholeness how we can create well-being for ourselves and each other um and the first part of it is on this kind of self-actualization stuff and then it transitions more into being with other people and then ends on meta modernity, um, which uh, I, I've got a podcast called Apodstemology, which is just young young researchers talking about their work. So there's some stuff on there and on meta modernity, and I'm going to upload a video to YouTube maybe today or tomorrow about it as well. Um, so this is kind of this uh, coalescence morality nihilism idea at the social scale. Um, so the book's got quite a lot on that. Um, I have a academic book that goes into some of this stuff called a theory of subjective well-being um but it's pretty academic so i don't know how much people are interested in reading that one but it is all kind of in there embryonically yeah but hopefully this pop book will be a bit more accessible and fun and that sort of thing well i'll, I'll link your um youtube video when it comes out and um certainly your um the academic book i've ordered it it hasn't come yet it takes a while but um yeah, I look forward to reading Theory of Subjective Wellbeing. And that was The Coalescence of Being with Dr. Mark Fabian. I really love this episode and this discussion. It was, you know, really steeped in philosophy and psychology, but just so valuable to have a discussion about things that aren't talked about that often, you know, particularly the lost art of introspection. You know, I really feel like that's something that I know I can use more of in my life just to help me gain more clarity over you know my own values my own goals and ultimately the ideal self that i'm working towards i hope that this episode also brought you know, a lot of value for you in your own life as well and certainly would love to hear about some of the big takeaways for yourself so please feel free to comment them below that's all for today and thanks for tuning in to the mental well-being show